Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webcast. Before we get started, um, I want to remind you of a few things you've seen flashing across your screen. First of all, you can adjust your screen at any time by toggling the uh, actual size fit to screen box in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. And if you're disconnected for any reason during the webcast, you can always log back in and join the webcast again. We've had to mute the telephone lines because of the large number of people uh, dialing in today um, to reduce the background noise. So you can submit questions for Jonathan, I mean Jonathan, <laughs> you can submit questions for Steve via chat and he'll answer them during the presentation and after the presentation. Feel free to submit them whenever they come up. And um, you may want to minimize your chat window or drag it off to the side during the presentation if you find it a distraction. And now I'm going to uh, turn the presentation over to Andy Oram. He's senior editor for O'Reilly Media and a great writer in his own right and an all-around great guy. Andy? Thank you. All right, this is my pre prepared statement as an introduction to Steve. Speed is critical on websites. If you make your web visitors take an extra half second to view a page, they feel it. And they're likely to go more often to a competing site that eliminates the half second delay. But performance is also complicated with multiple interlocking considerations involving heavy testing, right? Wrong. Steve Suters, author of O'Reilly's popular book, High Performance Websites, and co-chair of our upcoming Velocity Conference in June, has made web performance a breeze. He has identified approximately 30 straightforward rules involving simple trade-offs you can understand and decide on, rules that dramatically speed up the display of your site's web pages. Steve is also an engaging presenter, as you're about to find out in this webcast. Thousands have benefited from his book and his presentations on that subject. Tomorrow at the Web 2.0 Expo in San Francisco, Steve will make a presentation from 1.30 to 2.20 p.m. Steve is also the co-chair of Velocity, which I mentioned. You've seen splash screens about it, too, but I was asked to talk about it. It's a new O'Reilly conference dedicated to web performance and operations. Velocity is on June 23rd to 24th. 2008 in Burlingame, California. The theme is Fast, Scalable, Resilient, Available. Speed and scalability are the promise behind the rules in Steve's book and presentation. Now he's going to give you a taste of his performance approach. Stay tuned. All right, thank you, Andy. This is a uh, exciting week for me. It was one year ago exactly that I did a presentation at Web 2.0 Expo San Francisco, and those slides uh, reached number two across all topics on DIG, which is pretty hard to achieve. And it's been an exciting year. A lot has happened. Um, Steve, why slow came out, my book came out, I've spoken at several conferences, and, uh, and the Velocity Conference has gotten organized. And so it's uh, just fun to look back on the past year at everything that's happened. And one exciting part of that, maybe the most exciting part of that, has been how willing Yahoo and now my current employer, Google, have been at uh, supporting me to talk about these web performance best practices uh, outside to, to the general development community. And so I'm really happy to do that today. And, and of course, O'Reilly is... Uh, great to work with on that. They, Andy was my editor, and, and uh, we had a great time doing the book, and Tim O'Reilly has been very supportive in doing the Velocity Conference, and all the other folks, Catherine and all the other folks at O'Reilly. So I want to extend a word of thanks to them for that. Um, Steve, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, have you, you need to accept the window that lets, makes you the presenter, cause, because we're not seeing your screen right now. Okay, there we go. Okay, there, thanks. All right. I wanted to make sure that we had that. Okay, sorry for the interruption. Oh, that's okay. It's, uh... Oh, and the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, Andy has met my three girls. They're here in the conference room with me at Google today because it's Bring Your Child to Work Day. So hi. we have some girls, you want to say hi? Hi. So we had some fun this morning. Google has a ball pit, so we were all playing in the ball pit, and we had breakfast, and there's some other activities. But as part of seeing what uh, I do at work, I thought it would be good for them to sit in on this presentation. 
Um, so, uh, uh, previously I was the chief performance Yahoo. I worked at Yahoo for about eight years and, and for the last three years there, I worked on web performance. And uh, now I'm at Google uh, doing a similar role. And one of the m most important things that I've done as part of my work has been what I call turning the view on web performance upside down. So most of my career working in the web industry has been working on large back-end architectures. And whenever someone would say that our website was too slow, I would look at the back-end uh, application code and try to look for performance improvements there. Um, you know, better database indices, compiler options, uh, replicating code across multiple data centers, pretty large complex projects. Um, but then when I took on the role at Yahoo to work on web performance from the end user's perspective, I took a step back and I looked at where was the user spending most of her time waiting. And so the slide that I'm showing now is some people call it a waterfall chart or a HTTP profile. Each of the blue horizontal bars is an HTTP request. And this chart is from my favorite packet sniffer called IBM Page Detailer. Uh, you can search for it and find the link. Down the left-hand side are icons that indicate different types of HTTP requests. So the first one is an HTML document. The red dollar sign looking thing is a style sheet. Below that, the scroll looking thing is a script, then a JPEG image, then a GIF, and so on. And what we see here is, is that, in this case, this is uh, iGoogle uh, fetched with an empty cache. We see that there are about 30 items, but across the whole time, the, the x-axis here is time, across the whole time that the user is waiting for this page to load, only 9% of that time was spent getting the HTML document from the back end. And that 9% that even includes the time for the request to go up to the server, for the server to stitch together the response, and then for that HTML document to come back. The other 91% is what, for shorthand, I call the front, front end. It actually does involve network traffic, but it's everything after the HTML document. What did the HTML document dictate the browser had to do, and then how quickly did the browser perform that, execute that? And so in this case, for iGoogle with an empty cache, only 9% is spent on the back end. The other 91% is spent on the front end. And with a prime cache, this is like a subsequent page view, uh, it's still pretty lopsided. 17% is spent on getting the HTML document, and 83% is spent on the front end. And what we see here is there are much fewer HTTP requests because iGoogle does a really good job of making all of their images and style sheets cacheable. So there's a big white gap in the middle. And what's happening here is the HTML document is being downloaded. The browser parses it and sees that there's a bunch of images and style sheets and scripts and starts reading those from the cache off disk. And that actually takes time. And then what's taking a bulk of the time is the browser parsing the JavaScript and CSS and executing any JavaScript. And so when I first noticed this at Yahoo, I thought, well, perhaps this was some anomaly of the specific Yahoo properties I was looking at. But then when I go out and look at the top 10 websites in the US, um, according to Alexa, we find that this is generally true, that a large majority of the time that the user is waiting for a page to load is on these front-end components. There are a couple exceptions here, Google and Live Search. These pages are very uh, optimized. They have very few, very little HTTP traffic in them, maybe two to four HTTP requests. So it's not that the HTML document is taking a larger amount of time in absolute terms. It's just that as a percentage, it's a larger percentage. And we actually see here that live search is so optimized in a prime cache scenario, there are no HTTP requests other than the HTML document. But in general, we see this trend, and I call it the performance golden rule, that 80 to 90% of the overall user experience is spent on the front end. If you want to improve things from the user's perspective to make your pages faster, you have to start there. 
and there are three basic reasons to back that up. One is there's an a priori greater probability of making an impact. If you had the time and the resources to work on back-end performance improvements, and by your wildest dreams you could cut it in half, you would only cut 5 to 10% off the end user response time. Whereas if you can cut the front end time in half, you're cutting 40 to 45% off the response time, something much more noticeable by users. So there's just a greater chance of making an impact working on the front end. The changes are simpler. I talked before about some of the back end performance uh, projects that you might take on. Database indices, compiler optimizations, caching architectures, code replication. These are multi-month, if not multi-year long tasks. Whereas the suggestions that I propose for the front end are pretty simple. Things like adding some uh, configuration changes to your web server, um, moving resources in di to different areas of your web page. So many of these are one-line changes, and these types of projects take uh, maybe a few hours, maybe at most a few days. And so they're much simpler. And the third reason is that they're proven to work. Um, at Yahoo, I work with a lot of properties. Now at Google, I'm working with properties. And we're seeing that it's pretty easy to drop in and get a 25, maybe even a 50% improvement on uh, by adopting these, these performance best practices. Perhaps the greatest example of that is Yahoo Search, where before I left, we spent a, my team spent about a year and a half working with them, and over that year and a half, improved uh, the response time that, so much that we cut 40% off the response time of Yahoo Search using these best practices. And I also get, you know, now that the information is out there, uh, in the public forum, I get emails every day. I got two emails today from people talking about how they've used these best practices and they're making a big impact on, on speeding up their web pages. So the stuff really works. Where I went from, from that observation was now that I knew where to focus on this front end part, I worked on researching and, and working with development teams to find out what things could we change that and how much of an impact would it have in speeding things up. And I came up with these 14 rules, and they're in approximate priority order. And these are the rules that when I go out and, and I evangelize performance or work with a team to improve their web performance, I focus on these rules, and I make sure that these rules are being followed. Once I identified the rules, I could go out and work with teams and see how well they were following them, but that was uh, that wasn't a very scalable approach. With hundreds of development teams to reach, there just wasn't the time for me to sit down and talk with each one of them. So I built this uh, Firefox plugin called YSlow. And it's actually an extension to Firebug, and I'll do a demo of this later in the talk. But you can see an example of it here. Um, there's the Firebug uh, buttons there, console, HTML, CSS, script, DOM, net. And then there's a new one that you'll only see if you install YSLO. And when you click on the YSLO and, and kick it off, what it actually does is analyze the page for each of the, excuse me, each of the rules. And it gives you a grade and then it gives you an overall weighted score for the entire page. And this has proven to be really popular. Hundreds of thousands of people are using this. And uh, it allows people across teams or even across companies to talk about how performant their page is in uh, absolute terms, in apples to apples terms. And so it's uh, uh, been really successful. And then that came out in June of last year. And then in September, my book, High Performance Websites, came out. And it has a chapter, about 10 pages, dedicated to each of the rules with some other introductory information and a survey of the top 10 websites um, done with a performance analysis. Um, and then as Andy mentioned, uh, I'm very excited to be co-chair of Velocity. Uh, this came out of the very positive response to Why Slow in my book and people really, people in the industry feeling like they needed a forum for performance and operations engineers to share their best practices and their lessons learned. And so that's what's going to happen uh, June 23rd and 24th here uh, right near SFO. 
Uh, we're going to have a lot of industry experts and vendors there to talk about uh, how they make their website scalable and fast. Um, oh, and I wanted to mention that, just really quick, a plug for that is the uh, price goes up May 5th. There's an early registration discount. And then on top of that, um, if you use this discount code, you can get another 20% off. So if you use this discount code before May 5th, you can save about six or $700 on the registration price. So what I wanted to do, for the sake of time, um, I, I just wanted to talk about a few of these rules and give you an example of what they, uh, what they involve. Um, the first rule is, is a pretty obvious one, is if you want to speed up your page, and the main thing slowing the page down are all the HTTP requests, just re reduce the number of HTTP requests. But the twist here is, how can you do that without reducing the content on the page? Presumably the images and CSS and JavaScript on the page are there for a purpose. They serve the users. If not, you can talk to your product people and talk about the features that you could take out of the page. But assuming the page has the content you want, there are still ways that you can serve that content faster. Um, here are some examples. CSS sprites. Uh, I'll talk about those in the next slide. Combining scripts and style sheets. So if you have four scripts, separate scripts, there's HTTP overhead in doing four separate requests. Just concatenate all those scripts together and just do one HTTP request and it'll be faster. Image mass is kind of an old school approach of taking multiple images and combining them into one. Inline images is very exciting. This is the uh, data URL scheme where you can actually take the uh, base64 encoded binary output of an image and embed it in the HTML document. So you can have images in your HTML document without any HTTP requests for that image. And uh, this has only been supported in Firefox and other browsers, but it's now supported in IE8. So that's very exciting. But the biggest one of these is doing CSS sprites. So I wanted to really quick give an example of that. Here's a bunch of uh, icons that would be used on the Yahoo front page. And whereas previously they might have been downloaded as 60 separate image files with a lot of overhead incurred, instead they can be combined into one image. And what happens is if you have some box, let's say a span, that you want to uh, be the My Yahoo icon, you can use the CSS background position property to say where do you want to offset this box uh, on top of this background image. And so you could say minus 260, minus 90, size your span the right way with the right width and height, and get the correct background you wanted um, that was just a subset of this larger background image. And so here's a way that you can take multiple CSS background images and that might be separate files, separate image files, and combine them into one. And it actually turns out that the uh, even though there's more padding between the images in this approach, um, the size of the combined image is actually less than the sum of the separate images because each of those image files have some uh, color table and image formatting information that's duplicated. So you actually get a size reduction by combining them. Uh, another rule I wanted to talk about is making sure that your resources are cacheable by the browser. And you can do that by adding an expires or cache control header where you tell the browser that it can cache that resource for a long time into the future, a month, a year, maybe even 10 years. And so what we see here is a survey of some popular websites and how many, uh, for that website, how many of their resources are made to be cacheable. Um, and it might seem that, you know, for some sites like say CNN, maybe the reason they don't have very many cacheable resources is because it's a news site and these resources are changing constantly. But then what I did was I looked at uh, the last modified header for each of these resources. That tells you how long it's been since this image or script was modified. And for CNN, for example, we see that it's been, for more than 50% of the resources, they haven't changed in over seven months. So there's really no reason not to make those cacheable, and that's going to make subsequent page views for your users much faster, because rather than having to download an image or a script or a style sheet over the internet, the browser can just read it off the local disk. So that's really important. Uh, here's a rule that, that really talks more about the perceived
perceived load time of a page than the actual load time, putting style sheets at the top. It turns out that in Internet Explorer, the uh, browser will parse the HTML document, and if it, it builds a, a list of all of the resources it has to download, and if it sees that there's a style sheet in there to download, it won't render anything in the page until that style sheet is downloaded. But it also downloads things pretty much in the order it finds them in the page. So if you put a style sheet at the bottom of your page, the page is going to be blank for a long time because the browser is going to download the HTML document, download all the images and scripts and anything else that's higher up in the page, and then eventually, but it won't draw anything, even though it has those in the local browser, it won't draw anything until it eventually downloads the style sheet. So. Uh, that's a bad experience in Internet Explorer, and the solution is to just follow the HTTP spec. The HTTP spec says that style sheets should be in the head, and if you put them there, you'll avoid this problem of the page not rendering quickly. This also avoids a problem in Firefox where Firefox will draw the page, even though it hasn't downloaded all the style sheets, but if it downloads a style sheet later that contains rules that actually affect what's already drawn on the page, then Firefox will redraw the page, and that's called the flash of unstyled content. So to avoid that, um, you can also use the same solution, putting your style sheets in the head of the document. And just a final tip here, there's two ways to include style sheets, the link tag or the at import rule. And the link tag is preferred because in IE, the at import rule will actually cause the style sheet to be queued up later uh, in that download queue, which again will cause this blocking of rendering in Internet Explorer. And I think the last one I was going to talk about of those original rules was Rule 6, moving scripts to the bottom. This one is kind of interesting because it shows how com complex the behavior is in how the browser um, parses the page and downloads everything in the page. So here we see another waterfall or HTTP profile chart. And what happens in all browsers when a script is being downloaded is it blocks all other parallel downloads. So we see towards the end here, we see these images, four images at the end, all being downloaded in parallel. And that's great. We're getting the images as quickly as we can, as fast as they can come down over the wire. The browser is uh, reading them in. But when we hit this script, the long green bar, the third one down, when, when the browser hit that script, it stops all parallel downloads. And that's because the script might do things that alter the page, like it might do a document.write or even set the document.location of the page. And so browsers, uh, generally all browsers do this. They stop all downloads until the script is done. And this, as you can see in this example, has a big impact on the page. So what you can do to avoid this, oh, another problem is anything below a, an external script uh, will not be rendered until that script has been downloaded. So for both of these, solving both of these problems, it's good to move your, your external scripts as low in the page as possible. And that's not always possible. You might actually need to do a document.write higher in the page. But if not, if you can load that uh, script lower in the page, that's going to help it's gonna, uh, get other resources downloaded more quickly to be rendered in the browser, and it will allow the browser to render whatever it has downloaded as quickly as possible. So I wanted to uh, talk just briefly um, about the next set of, of rules or best practices that I'm working on. And uh, I've been working with Andy over the last couple of weeks on uh, sketching out another book um, to contain this work, and the working title is Even Faster Websites. Um, and so here are the rules that I've identified so far. I don't have time to go over these right now, but I just wanted to point out the first three, the most important ones that I've been focusing on. Um, split the initial payload, load scripts without blocking, and don't scatter scripts. And as we saw in the previous slide, scripts have a big impact on your web page. And so things that we can do to optimize script loading is going to have a big impact. And that's especially true as websites are moving more and more to Web 2.0 and Ajax and DHTML. Um, as I look across websites, I'm seeing more and more, I look at you know dozens of websites every day, I'm seeing more and more that the impact of JavaScript 
is getting to be more and more significant. I did a quick survey here of some of the top websites. And we can see like here in this one that AOL uh, HTTP profile is actually much bigger than this. You can see here we only have about the first 25%. And in that first 25%, Almost all of it is downloading JavaScript, and it's because of that blocking behavior. We get lots of other parallel downloads, but when the scripts are being downloaded, they block. And so most of this waterfall is spent downloading just four scripts, and that's because of the blocking behavior. Uh, here's eBay. Same thing. About It looks to me like about 30 40% is downloading just three or four uh, resources. Facebook, they have an amazing number of scripts. Uh, when I did these downloads, I was on a pretty fast connection. So each of those scripts came down fairly quickly, but still they took a large percentage of the download time because, again, they have this blocking behavior. MySpace, only two scripts, but of this overall download time, those two resources took about 20%. Wikipedia, five scripts taking up maybe a third of the download time. Yahoo, only one, uh, here, two scripts, but still they take a fairly significant amount of time. And that white space up at the top inside the first oval, that white space is probably some inline scripts that are executing, taking time. And finally, YouTube, only one script, but still about 20% of the total uh, waterfall time of this chart. So it's really important, uh, I think, in the coming year to focus on JavaScript. JavaScript is becoming more and more widely adopted, and best practices for improving the performance of JavaScript, both in how it's downloaded and how it's executed and parsed, are going to be key. So I'll be focusing on that area in my work over the next year and in my next book. So what I wanted to do now, I only have one more slide, I think, uh, but I wanted to take a break and do a quick demo of why slow and a little uh, uh, live performance analysis. What we see here is I'm inside Firefox and I uh, have Firebug loaded and I have the usual uh, tabs for Firebug. Um, but I also have this new YSLO tab. And I can click on performance and what it does is it gives me a grade for each of the rules. And here we see you know, the Google search page is highly optimized and has very few resources in it. So it gets a perfect score. Um, let's look at some other pages, though, that are a little more uh, complicated. Let's go to Yahoo. Uh, let's see, I don't think I'm logged in. Oh, no, I am logged in. And let's click on Performance. And here, this page is pretty complicated. If we look at the number of components, there's a fair number of components that were downloaded. And yet, even though this is, if you look at the page, it's a pretty complex page. It's got a lot of news, a lot of images, some new content. It's got information about my personal uh, preferences, my email and my local weather. And yet, this page still downloads pretty quickly. Down in the corner, we see a response time of about one and a half seconds. And it gets a YSLO grade of 93. This is really impressive. Uh, you know, the Yahoo team uh, has the performance team at Yahoo has done a lot of work with the Yahoo front page team, and it's really paid off. This is a tremendous page, a great balance of fast performance and rich content. Um, I want to just, just show some of the other uh, YSLO features. You can get stats uh, that show you for an empty cache how many requests of which type and a prime cache. It gives you cookie information. You can get a list of the components in the page, and for images, you can actually get little drop downs that show you uh, what the image looks like. Uh, you can even have, there's a variety of tools. I'll just quickly show the printable view. This is really nice if you need to make a slide or do a printout to take to a meeting. Um, so it's a nice tool. It's a great place to start to, to do analysis on your website. Let me just look at um, one more that I think is pretty interesting. So if we run YSLOW on this, on msn.com, it doesn't do that well. It gets an F. Um, some things, let's see, uh, it has nine scripts. Maybe some of those could have been concatenated. It has 
11 CSS background images, maybe a better use of sprites would pay off. Uh, the CDN rule could be optimized a little bit more, um, perhaps uh, to MDN and actually is a CDN. There's a way if you click on this preference, uh, you can see how to add your own CDN host names to make this rule more accurate for your personal website. Uh, there's some assets that don't have an expires header. Um, it seems like those could be cacheable. Um, uh, let's see, a lot of host names. So those are going to incur a DNS lookup penalty. Um, so that's something you want to pay attention to. But I want to point something out that's really positive about this page. Um, we talked before about the, the uh, pain of downloading scripts. And what do we see here? I'm looking at Firebug's net panel now where it shows some of the HTTP packets. And we see one, two, three JavaScript files being downloaded in parallel. And even a style, two style sheets being downloaded in parallel with this previous uh, script. So how does that happen? It turns out that they've used uh, one of the advanced uh, script downloading techniques that I'm going to be talking about in my talk tomorrow at Web 2.0 Expo. Um, and by using this advanced technique, even a large-scale website like MSN.com can safely change, uh, optimize the way the browser is downloading the assets in the page. And you can imagine the difference if these three scripts had to be downloaded sequentially rather than in parallel. You can imagine the impact that that would have on the load time of this page. So this is some really impressive work, and kudos to the MSN team for rolling this out. Okay, I wanted to go back to the presentation and wrap up and then take questions. Um, so quick takeaways, uh, you know, don't, don't stop thinking about your back-end architecture. That's really important, especially for, you know, hardware and bandwidth costs. But if you really want to make a big improvement on uh, the user response times, you have to focus on the front end. Running YSLOW is a great place to start there. Uh, you'll get some specific recommendations. They're usually the low-hanging fruit, easy to implement, and you'll notice a big, big difference. Don't forget about Velocity if you want to hear myself and other industry gurus uh, speak that's coming up and try to register before May 5th with that discount code. Oh, I wanted to mention these slides are available on my website, stevesouders.com, so you can download them there later if you want. And don't forget that speed matters. There's, you know, even if it seems pretty fast to you, you might be sitting close to your data center or even you might be working um, at work where you have a testing at work where you have a fast connection. There's always people who have a slower internet connection where it's not going to be so fast. And if you're a world, if you have a worldwide presence, there are going to be people in more remote regions that don't have such great internet connectivity. There's always someone who is suffering from a slower experience. And if you take your eye off the ball, if you don't focus on making the page as fast as possible, then um, it's not going to be as good for them, and they might be driven to one of your competitors. And there's also always someone creeping up behind you, someone who might pass you by if you're not focusing on performance. And one of the key ways they might beat you is by offering uh, speed as a new feature. So keep your eye on the ball. Uh, speed really matters. And if you follow these best practices, you actually can make your site even faster than it is already. So that was it. Uh, I, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. We can. Uh, just talk about the slides, or if someone wanted me to run something back in Weisslaw, I'm happy to do that as well. Steve, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. This is Catherine. Um, we had, during your presentation, we had a problem with uh, some of the, uh, the streaming audio on some of the sites. Some people lost their sound, but I have let them know that this is being recorded, and, you know, I'm really sorry about that. I think so many people dialed in that uh, we pushed the system to its uh, um, you know, too far. So uh, we will have the recording available, and I'll send that to all of them. But I just wanted to let you know about that. Um, so, so we should we get the, have... the the host. We should get the host of the streaming audio to go to Velocity and, and hear some of the gurus talk about scalability. You know what? I'll encourage them to do that. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think they need to. Um, but we did have a few questions that came in while um, you were talking, and one was when you were uh, talking about uh, the, um, I'm just going back to some of the earlier questions. Someone asked um, about the script downloading, blocking the image downloads. He wanted to know how you found out that the script downloading blocked the image downloads for IE. He said, did you do that through profiling or MS support? I think just curious. Yeah, so we can look at that. Um, uh, you know, if we look at a more typical site, here, let me clear my cache. And uh, let's see, I'm pretty sure Google uh, has a JavaScript download. So let me go there. No, it doesn't. Uh, let's see. We'll go to, um, uh, how about iGoogle? And so, you know, just by looking at these, at this HTTP profile, we can see uh, here's a JavaScript file. When the JavaScript, here's another one. You can see when the JavaScript files are being downloaded um, that nothing else is being downloaded in parallel. And so that's the way you can see. And there's also um, several uh, uh, tech tech blogs, tech papers that talk about that behavior and why it exists. Um, and so that's one way to observe it. Um, I guess I'll also point out, let me, let me go here to my website, and uh, here's the examples from my uh, first book. And let's see. Uh, And Here's the one about the scripts blocking. I'm sorry? I, I, think the person, I think the person was asking about um, IE. Uh, is there a way to, is it the same in IE? Oh, yeah. Sure. Let's see, let me fire up, uh, first let me, since I can't use Firebug inside IE, let me start IBM Page Detailer, and then I'll start Internet Explorer. And, uh, oh, actually here I have HTTP watch running. That'll be good. Well, I see that's a little different. Let me use my other packet sniffer. I'll do the same thing. I'll go to stevesouders.com. Here you can see the discount code for Velocity. And over here are the slides from this talk. Uh, but here, let's go to the examples. We'll go to rule six. And uh, let's see. Load this one. And you can see that there's a script right below here, and if, if nothing is rendering below this point in the page because it's downloading the script, you can see it's downloading the script because this is busy. And then finally, after the script is downloaded, it, down, it renders the rest of the page. So that's the blocking of rendering that I was talking about. And now, if we go look at the packet sniffer, we can see that even though the browser knew it had these four images in the queue to download. It didn't start downloading any of them because it was waiting for the script to come back. So that's a way that you can observe that behavior. Okay, and I think someone else asked on a related subject, um, what about inline scripts? Do they have the same behavior? This is quite a ways back. <laughs> um, yeah, they do. Uh, if you uh, have an inline script, the browser won't download things. Well, uh, it depends. If you have have style sheets and in inline scripts, that will actually block download behavior. But if you have a few images with some inline scripts, it will actually download the images in parallel with the inline script. I see that Eric Lawrence is uh, who's a great guy on the IE team is online, and he mentioned Fiddler. And I wanted to point, let me go ahead and fire up Fiddler as another packet sniffer. Um, and he's correct, he's, he's on the, the chat. This is another really powerful tool. It's got a lot of features that go above and beyond what, what Page Detailer does. You can uh, do more manipulation of the HTTP traffic um, and so uh, 
I think that it's just, uh, I think if now it's Fiddler2.com, you can go to the download it, and it's actually free, whereas IBM Page Detailer has a cost. Um, so yeah, I want to give a shout out to Eric. Uh, he does a lot of work on Fiddler, and it's all publicly available. Um, so try that out too as another uh, possible packet sniffer. Oh, great. Um, someone was asking about e-tags, and uh, could we talk about e-tags in a multi-server environment? Yeah, e-tags are kind of complicated. That's why I kind of skipped over that rule for this short talk. Um, basically, what e-tags let the browser do is validate that what it has in the cache uh, matches what's on the server. So like even if you have something that's cacheable that the user hits reload, um, the browser is going to double check with the server that what it has in the local disk is still valid, that it can still be used. And, the, and that's a, a huge benefit. If, if the browser can just, you know, if the browser has a, a 30K image, and they can just check with the server and say, is the image I have on disk correct? And the server says yes, then it doesn't have to download 30K. You can just read it off the disk. So you can get huge savings by that uh, optimized um, validation in HD, that's part of HTTP. The problem is with um, Apache and IIS, the default implementation of e-tags contains information that will almost never match across two web servers. So uh, the odds are, you know, greater than 50% that when the user uh, reloads the page and, and the browser checks with the web server, the web server will say, oh, no, I'm sorry, the thing on your local disk doesn't match what I have. Here, let me send you the whole 30K again. So e-tags are a very powerful thing that was introduced in HTTP 1.1, but most people don't use them for the power and flexibility that they're provided for. And if you don't turn them off, if you just leave them there and don't use them, it's actually going to hurt your performance. So if you need to use them, great. If you're not using them, I recommend turning them off. Okay. Um, someone was asking, can you uh, expand on how MSN.com accomplished the parallel loading of scripts? Yeah. Um, let me go ahead and try to do that live because uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's, Whoa, what happened there? Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to view source. This is another optimization they do. They uh, uh, minify their page. They remove all white space. That makes it hard when you're debugging, but it makes it uh, smaller to download for users. So that's a great optimization. What I'm going to do, I noticed that behavior in the packet sniffer. I'm just always doing that all day long, loading pages, looking at packet sniffers, noticing things that are unusual and tracking them down. And so uh, I noticed that and I said, well, how are, they, how are they downloading their scripts? I know one of the scripts was hptr.js. Okay, there's the script. And normally you would expect to see like a script source tag in HTML, but instead I'm actually inside a bunch of JavaScript. Okay, so let me, so what I did was I said, let's look at this JavaScript file. Let me search for where that script ends, right there. And then I did a quick query replace where I inserted a bunch of new lines here. But since I know we're going to do all of that now, I knew that I was looking for something like create element. And sure enough, there it is. And so here's what they're doing. They are saying, let me create a script element. Let me give it uh, the type text JavaScript. Let me add some handlers for the on ready state change, on error, on load. We'll just ignore that for now. Here's the key part right here. E, in this case, is a URL. It's hptr.js. Let me set the, this script element source to that URL. And when you do that and then append the script element to the page, uh, it actually loads the script, but it loads it without blocking. So this is one of about five or six t advanced techniques 
And it's just really cool to see such a popular, you know, widely used website. Uh, to, you know, it's a little bit risky to do things that are, are more advanced, that are more technical. And, and again, huge kudos to MSN for caring so much about the user experience and researching this and, and rolling it out. It's very cool. We have a, um, if anyone else has questions, feel free to submit them. I, I'm looking back over the uh, questions that people sent in earlier, and um, I don't know if this is relevant or not. Someone's asking how you convince an organization to invest in a CDN. Well, you know, first the organization has to believe that it's important to have fast response times. And, you know, that seems so, you know, obvious to me, uh, but, you know, that's unbiased. I mean, that's, you know, I love optimizing things. And, and so sometimes you have to do things that, that can convince the business that a faster response time is going to improve the bottom line. And there's been some stats published by Marissa Myers here at Google. She published a stat that said um, when, when Google search was 500 milliseconds slower, it lost 20% of its traffic. And since Google search traffic is directly tied to revenues, that's 20% of the revenue. So 500 milliseconds cost Google search 20% of their revenue. Uh, there's another stat uh, from Amazon that says for every 100 milliseconds of delay, it costs them 1% of sales. So I don't have any details. I, I have URLs that people want to ping me later on uh, that point to those stats. I don't know how they conducted those experiments, but certainly these people are industry leaders and they have done the work to convince themselves that speed is important to the bottom line. Now, once you believe that, it's just a matter of measuring performance. So if you can use a service like Keynote or Gomez or Webmetrics or Alexa, and you can see that by using a CDN, it makes your page half a second faster, then you can take that to the business people and make an argument for how that's important to the company. Uh, and on the CDN front, you know, kind of the industry leader is Akamai, but I want to do a plug for Panther Express. I don't have any affiliation with them. Uh, I just know a lot of people have been using them lately, and um, they have great service and a and, uh, better price point. Okay, and, and one person was asking, are there any scenarios where a CDN is a bad idea? Well, you know, it's possible that, um, I'm not that familiar with them, but certainly in, in some of the emerging markets like Southeast Asia, uh, internet connectivity is, you know, can, can vary widely depending on region. So there actually could be a case where, like, maybe you're actually located uh, in, you know, Thailand or Singapore or something like that, and, and if you actually serve things from your own data center, it could reach your users faster than if you went through a CDN that didn't have such a great uh, local presence. But in general, if you're striving for a worldwide presence, the cost of doing that yourself is going to be extremely high, and that's why there's a, a industry of these uh, CDN providers to fill that void at a, at a lower price point. So in general, no, I, I don't think there are very many scenarios where a CDN is bad. Good. Um, another person is asking, is it, um, is it better to have multiple scripts or consolidate as many scripts as possible, as you suggest? It is confusing. If you're not going to use any of the advanced techniques, then I recommend you just do one. Um, if you're going to use some of these advanced techniques, uh, then you could do them separately and actually get faster downloading because of the parallel behavior of the downloads. Um, so it depends on how much you're able to invest in your development resources for your site. Um, so for you know, most sites that are still doing just a normal HTML script source, it would be better to consolidate them all. 
but if you're willing, like MSN, to do something that's uh, more a, a little more complicated, then keeping them separate might actually be faster. Okay. I'll be talking about that more tomorrow, and my slides from tomorrow will also be available on my website after after the talk. So if you're not able to attend tomorrow, um, you could look at the slides where I have a pretty lengthy analysis of these script downloading techniques. And I'll be blogging about that too. I, sh I should plug my blog. If you're not subscribed to my blog, I'll be, uh, especially in the next week, I'll be doing about four or five. I'm also doing a code release of a new performance tool tomorrow at, at Web2.0 Expo, so I'll be blogging about that. Um, so check out my website tomorrow to see some of that news. Okay, there are a couple other questions. Do you want to answer them, or should I ask people to post them in the uh, forum? Let's see, it's 10.51. How about, uh, I'm willing to do three or four more minutes. Okay, there, uh, someone, Woody is asking, is the parallel thing a hack, or actually per spec of adding tags in this manner? Do you see that question? Well, I don't think uh, this, yeah. I don't think the HTTP spec talks about um, blocking. Uh, I think that's a behavior that browsers found they had to adopt um, given, given what JavaScript could do. Um, and I'll also point out that in Opera 6 for, for uh, at least you know, the, uh, several months, they've actually supported parallel downloading of scripts and IEA came out with that uh, in a bill several months ago, and um, and so that that kind of work is coming. But as people who build websites know, you know, even if IEA supports that, it's going to be years before their, uh, all the IE6 and IE7 people have moved to IE8. So this is a problem that's going to be around for at least several more years. So it's not in the spec. I wouldn't call it a hack either. Um, I think it's you know understanding how JavaScript and the browser works and figuring out ways to optimize that. It's kind of like CSS sprites. You know, it's not a hack. It's an advanced technique, and if you can invest a little bit more time, you can create a better user experience. Okay. So I'm not sure. I'm looking at the. Uh Questions here. Um, I think you answered them. Someone asked a question about IE6, and I see that Eric answered that. So um, someone else is asking, how do different browsers handle the create element script technique? And maybe that's the last question we should take. Oh, um, let's see. Uh, okay, so. Let's see, I'll go ahead and I'll do a little, this will be the last, yeah, let's make this the last one. I'll do a little sneak preview here of my uh, talk tomorrow, and I'll just show one slide. Um, that I think is pretty, uh, pretty powerful. Um, so here are the different techniques that I'm going to be reviewing tomorrow and talking about in my, uh, one of the chapters of my next book. And so we can see these different techniques, and I call that, that create element one, it's the one, two, three, four, fifth one down, script DOM element. And in both IE and Firefox, it supports parallel downloads. Um, a nice thing about it is, uh, unlike the XHR and iframe techniques, it's a technique you can use when the domain of the main web page is different than the domain of the scripts which is the case in that MSN example, which is probably why my guess is the MSN guys know about all this stuff I'm talking about. And they picked that, this technique because it was the right one for them because they had a different domain. Um, in IE, it doesn't make the browser look busy. Uh, for example, the status bar and the, and the progress bar, but it does in Firefox. A nice thing about it is that in Firefox, at least, it will preserve the order of the scripts. So if you need, if you have code dependencies between your scripts, this is a good choice for Firefox. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that in the case of those three JavaScript files for MSN, there were not uh, code dependencies. 
And it's a pretty lightweight uh, implementation. It's only a few hundred characters that you would have to add of JavaScript to your page to do it this way versus some of the XHR techniques are a little heavier. And so maybe it's a little mean to leave on that point because there might be a lot more questions that come from that. Um, but uh, why don't we leave it there? Okay. And check out my website right. tomorrow uh, for more news about my talk and the slides and the code release. Good. Well, I think, um, I think that's all the questions. Steve, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, you'll see someone was asking oh, about your presentation tomorrow is being screencast. Yeah, I wish it was. I don't think it is. <laughs> Catherine, thank you so much for organizing this and working with me to set it up. And Andy, um, thank you too. Are, are you still on? <laughs> you probably is. Hi, probably Andy. Is. Yeah, I'm still here. Hi, Andy. Um, yeah, thank, thanks to both of you, and I want to thank everyone who uh, joined us here. And I will have the recording of this available next week, and I'll send a link to everyone who um, registered. I'll use the email that you registered with. If you have a different email address it's for me to send it to, then please send that to webcast at O'Reilly.com, and I'll uh, make sure you get it. We also have it posted on our site, so you can just uh, search for it. And um, and I want to mention there's also a forum on our site. It, the link was in the email that I sent you yesterday. And uh, if you have questions for Steve, you can post them there, and he'll be sure to answer them.